let's do this. We're here with Thomas Hamelrick, the uh, professor of artificial intelligence and general philosophical thinker. Would you call yourself a philosopher, Thomas? Uh, uh, good heavens, no. Not really, no. I, I, I read philosophy. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's useful, but I, I don't really consider myself a philosopher now. Nice. Well, but I, I don't. I, don't I've, I never really studied Hegel, and oh, no. <laughs> I think oh, that's the no. definition of, of being a philosopher, right? You, you really like Hegel, and you think. I mean, I I, I study a lot of. I, I'm very fond of Whitehead, and it seems that Whitehead is kind of like the, the the Hegel for people who know mathematics, um, but uh, but never really never really deeply dived into Hegel. So that makes me not a philosopher. Oh, not a continental philosopher. Presumably, you can be an American philosopher, although they're not real philosophers, according to the European philosophers. Yeah, there's the, an interesting bunch of philosophers. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm onto them. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that said, let's start up, like we said, with uh, exploring this, this thesis of yours that the internet is an apocalypse in a technical sense. What does that mean? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, so this is, yeah, there's a lot of to unpack here, right? So, um, so one of the, one of the, the thinkers that I'm very fond of, I don't know if you can call him a philosopher, he was uh, more like a, uh, uh, anthropologist, uh, uh, basically a thinker, so René Girard. And, um, so, and so, uh, so he has, uh, he has a lot of, of, um, um, his thinking evolves a, a, a lot around around apocalypse, and um, so it's basically if you apply the the, the ideas of Rene Girard to the to the, the current times, um, then then I think that's a very good fit. And um, uh, apocalyptic times are basically times where where a lot of the of the structure that kept let's say some really old ancient patterns, uh, destructive patterns that, that humans uh, play out, right? If the, if the frameworks that keep these patterns in check, if these fall, fall away, and, and I think we are in, in, in a time like that, when these fall away, then you basically have apo apocalyptic times. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, that, um, that, that it will be mayhem in the, and destruction, right? But it, it's, it's a time of chaos. It's a time of uncertainty, and it's also a time of, of, uh, of potential new directions and new developments. So I think that's how to understand uh, these apocalyptic times. So not so much as, as in that, uh, that we are necessarily uh, bound to destruction, which we might well be. But in, in any case, uh, new orders and new ways of thinking and new ways of, of uh, looking at things are emerging yeah. Yeah. There's this, uh, this orthodox idea called the catechon, which you're probably aware of, which mm -hmm. is this idea of that which restrains the rogue desire. Um, so in your opinion, what is it about internet that dissolves these restraining structures? Yeah, so, so one of, the, one of the, the things that is very unusual now is that, that we are all, we, I mean, it's a cliche, right? We're all interconnected. So, and that's, that's never been happened before, but it's, there's actually kind of a, it's actually kind of a deeper thing than you would, than you would, um, than you would, um, you would expect because it's not only so that we're now very much connected, but it's also so that, for example, religion is very much concerned with keeping us apart. So a lot of the, of the structures that are there, uh, that, that structure our, our, our society are actually there to, to stratify society. So, so so, for example, so there are hierarchies in society, and this is also there because um, people who are closely connected to each other, they go easily into rivalry. And if you go into rivalry, then you get escalation of, of, uh, of, uh, of conflicts, and then you have all these destructive patterns that... Uh, that that come out right so you have like scapegoating you have conflict war of all against all and and that's why it's it's very dangerous in fact to to connect people without any any stratification now i'm not saying that that it shouldn't happen um you know we shouldn't confuse ought with is right so these are so i'm, I'm very very careful not to prescribe what how people should behave or how society should be structured so i'm more interested in kind of understanding what happens when you put this, this enormous amount of, of, of technology on, on top of a very archaic human? 
and 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 how basically this new technology actually brings about and exposes these these very very old old uh, ways of being so i'm throwing a lot of girard at you right so i i think that a lot of these things don't really make sense unless you you kind of uh, you kind of understand the the the, the girardian way of thinking but i th i think that will will probably develop um um, in the course of this conversation, I hope. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, so the Girardian basic, like you kind of touched on this mimetic rivalry. People have a tendency to observe what other people around them are doing and what they're desiring, crucially, and then desiring the same thing. I mean, it kind of makes sense because like, what the fuck do we want, really? And it's fucking hard to know what <laughs> what I want. But it's easy to see that, well, these people I hang around with want this. Or like, I mean, one of the weird things, like noticing my girlfriend wants something or finds something attractive. And next thing I know, like I want that or I find that attractive. That's kind of a, like a curious space where it shows up quite obviously. But then if you're in a, a social situation where there are limited resources or limited women, limited positions of power and authority, and everybody wants them, then there's going to be competitions, right? And unless there's some kind of order, framework, trusted way of doing things, that means the people who get the spoils get to keep them and the other people <laughs> don't end up being so resentful that they have to tear things apart and destroy it, unleash pure chaos just to try and get what they think they deserve, then, <laughs> then we wind up in a mess, right? And I guess kind of, what we see amongst some of the, the traditionalist philosophers who exist today, like Dugan, we've spoken to on the podcast, and then the kind of lineage coming out of Gwen yeah, Long. The legendary Dugan everyone... uh, podcast, I really enjoyed that. It was very, uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, so we've heard that from a few people. And like what these guys tend to go for, they really believe in that stratified society. So the idea of like the priests and the warrior caste mm -hmm. and then the merchant caste and then the... Uh, the undercast of some kind, very prominent in Hindu philosophy, but also shows up in yeah. some kind of like European traditionalist philosophy. And like, as I can make sense of it, this is precisely a mechanism for keeping apart mimetic rivalry. Sometimes what it seems to turn to in, in these philosophers or, or people who like these philosophers is kind of a sense of I'm a priest and I should be at the top. And I think that generally tends to be a perversion of what the actual idea is, or, or what the actual structure is about, whether or not the people who exist within the structure understand why the structure exists. And isn't that kind of one of the core Girardian points as well? It's like we create these structures, we have perhaps uh, religious traditions like Christianity, for example. We don't necessarily have the explicit understanding of mimetic rivalry or how our structures prevent it happening, but they still are able to prevent it to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so, so basically one of the... One of the the big uh, functions of religion is to to make sure that that desire doesn't get out of hand. Um, so that's and you can do that in two ways, right? So there's there's a, a you could call them pagan religions, and uh, they use the scapegoat mechanism. And then you have uh, other religions, such as, for example, uh, you know, let, let's say Christianity. So that that's really built. Let's say the, let's say the I would say like the, the most valuable parts of Christianity, they are built on exposing the scapegoat mechanism and then saying, well, well, this mechanism it is extremely, it, it's cruel. It's, uh, it leads to, uh, um, it's, it's basically something that is, um, how should I, basically it's called satanic essentially. So basically the, the scapegoat mechanism is essentially the, a, a satanic way of being. It's the mob that, um, that suddenly, um, gangs up on a, on a victim and then kills the victim. And most often that's a completely innocent victim. So, so there are religions who say, like, don't do that. That's, an, that's a, a way of being that is unacceptable. Um, and um, so you can find these ideas in Buddhism. You can find these, these ideas in Christianity and Hinduism. Um, so actually, I, I would like to study some other religions, like, for example, Islam, to see how these, uh, how these religions actually, actually deal with it. Um, but in any case, so even a pagan religion uh, that, that regularly kills scapegoats is still a religion that structures society. So, so there is still a lot of violence going on, but at least it's not chaotic violence. It's not violence of all against all. It's somehow kept in check. So once, in, once a month, 
in order to relieve the tension in our society, we are going to come together. We're going to have a nice, exciting ritual. We're going to decide that there's somebody here that deserves to die. So typically some kind of, uh, you know, some, a beggar or a leopard or, or somebody that, 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 that is guilty in the eyes of the society. And then we're going to kill that scapegoat. And by, by killing that scapegoat, we're going, to, um, we're going to get rid of the internal tension in our society. And then there will be peace again until the tensions build up again, and then we have to kill, to kill another scapegoat, right? So, so that's one way of um, of uh, of uh, of getting rid of tensions in in society. Um, so, but but if you remove all of these, if you remove this religious layer, which which what we are doing, which what we've done basically right now, so so religion is collapsing all over the place, especially in the West, right? So so we have the so this this structuring space of religion is being is is removed, is, is falling away. And on top of that, we've cross-linked everybody using digital means. So, so that's, that's kind of like a very interesting cocktail, right? So, so basically, a lot of people are now watching it and trying to understand what's going on, right? So, uh, and, and also building on, that's why I read philosophers and, and thinkers such as Jung and Freud and Lacan and, and Girard, uh, because we need to understand what are humans like? How do they behave? What, what's, what's, what's actually the, what's the, what's the core archaic aspect of humanity and how will that, that way of being, how will that mix with all this digital technology? So a lot of people are, are having all these conversations about, about politics and, you know, Trump this and Trump that and, and, and all of these kind. And, and of course, these, these, these discussions need to be held and that's all very, very good and dandy and stuff like that. But we also need to have the, the, the conversation about, about, let's say, the bigger picture, like maybe a philosophical picture, right? So what, what do we understand about humans? And, and what do we understand about, about technology? And so there's thinkers like Girard and Marshall McLuhan and, and stuff like that. I think that they deserve a lot more, uh, a lot, lot more attention than they get. It seems that everybody's kind of more interested in the, in, in the weather than in the news, hmm. so to say. Fantastic. Um, I believe that one of the reasons why what you just mentioned is very important, and also especially coming from you, is that today, more than ever, we have the ability to for example, through artificial intelligence, to understand, predict, model, and even prescribe behavior mm. through micro-targeting, through things like that. The effect of that on desire, especially on the desire of people who no longer have these religious frameworks, is very notable. Because, you know, after 1900, what are the great scapegoat-killing festivals? They are the World Cup they are these secular, social democratic, watered down collective rituals to sustain the collective world, but they just don't cut it. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you is, you know, as we enter the 2020s and the age of AI and, and the effects that that's going to have on behavior and desire, what's going to happen? Are we going to stay satanic? <laughs> are there any non-satanic threads? What's your view? Do you have any any point of view of what's going to happen to desire and to the ways of taking care of it in the next 10 years, for example? Um, but at the time being, I'm kind of like more, I'm kind of looking at things and trying to understand what's, what's going on, not so much predicting things and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and trying to, um, um, yeah. so, so, so with respect to, um, so one of the things that you can see, for example, which I think is very striking is the, is the, the creation of mobs uh, via, the, via social media. And that is a very good example of how people revert to very archaic ways of being. And that's made possible through, through digital means. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's, that's very tie, uh, tie, uh, tie, um, um, tied to, um, um, to, to the problem of, of, uh, of desire to, and, and uh, uh, rivalry conflict and then especially um, relieving the tension that comes from conflict through scapegoating. Yes. So, so that's a very good example of, of what can happen if, if the, if the um, let's say if this, this digital era just, uh, just proliferates without, um, well, without what? I mean, that's a question, without what? What kind of, I don't know what to answer, what, what to answer to that, right? So, so how are we going to avoid that, that um, these, these archaic patterns, like, for example, mob formation, scapegoating, uh, escalation of conflict, 
uh, mimesis. So let's say that that you have a, a couple of groups that are that are fighting with each other. So you have this. So you have this typical escalation where one side does something and then the other side retaliates, and that basically leads to an escalation of the conflict because these these uh, these groups will will copy each other. So then the question is, well, well what kind of what kind of uh, ways of being, what kind of what kind of technologies, what kind of religious are we are we going to have to 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 keep these these types of behaviors in check? Um, right now, I don't really see a lot. <laughs> That's the problem. I actually there's nothing out there, right? I mean, there's just basically a lot of of, uh, of humans who are pretty clueless, who don't have any religion, and who are not being interlinked very intensely. That means intense um, intense competition, um, intense mimetic desire. Right, and so maybe we should. I don't know. Do, do we need to discuss what mimetic desire is, or we assume that the audience knows that, or, or I don't know what your form of this. Well, I think <laughs> I tried to touch on it on this idea that people end up wanting what people around them want. Right, we end up all kind of desiring the same thing just because it's easier to want what other people want than it is to want what. Uh, to figure out what I actually. But, but I think it's. I think it's. It's worthwhile to make that a bit more. Uh, a bit more to put that a bit more in a powerful way. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you want what you want is what others want. That's what desire is. So it's not just something that, well, you know, I desire a lot of stuff, but sometimes I pick up what other people want. It's not like that. That's not the Girardian theory, right? So basically the, the, the Girardian, Girardian way of being is that everything you want is what you pick up from others. We are in a big interlinked uh, network of desire, essentially. And that used to be on the level of a tribe, you know, 150 people. Then it was like a city, you know, maybe a couple of thousand people. And now we've, we're, we're interlinked with interlinked desire on the level of millions and millions of people. So that's kind of, that's, that's like playing with a, with a very, very powerful and, uh, and, and dangerous, um, let's say, uh, aspect of, of, of humanity. And, and, and tying it up with, uh, with, with digital technology. It's so interesting that <clears throat> religion did say, or rather it did provide these scaffoldings for, how pe for, for what people should desire, or rather they managed how desire came to be in order to, for it to, to be managed. And what's interesting today, or what's something that is interesting for, for what I explore is that it is not only about what to desire that we mimic from each other in the digital age, but also how we desire. So it's not only about the content, you know, but it's also about how the person desires the content. It's not about desiring the good, the consumer good, but to consume ways of desiring that good. This is kind of a Heideggerian feedback loop where it's not only about what we want and how we, uh, but it's also about how we want. Do you have anything to say about this weird loop? What, is desi what does desire want? Is it just an object or, or is it, can it also mimic ways to reach that object? Could you perhaps clarify that a little bit? What, what, what do you mean by, by ways of reaching that object? ways of desiring. So right now, desire, I, I desire the lifestyle of an Instagram influencer, but I do so through Instagram. Um, and so Instagram is in itself kind of this, it, it has these fetish characteristics. I do not only desire the lifestyle, but how, how that lifestyle is, is, is reached technologically. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Um. Let, let me give another, another example. For example, religion said in the Ten Commandments, thou mm -hmm. shalt not kill. Yeah, right. It provided a framework for people to live under. So if I kill, I'm bad. And if I don't kill, I'm good. And that is the, the how, the, the, the desire is always in this framework. And I would argue that technology yeah. today creates new frameworks. Today, the thou shalt is created by Instagram, for example. I don't know if this makes it any clearer. Oh yeah, yeah. I see what you're. What you're. Uh, I think I see what you. What you mean. So, so you, we we went from like you know you have the the Ten Commandments, um, and and you're quite right. I mean, basic, especially the Ten Commandments. There are basically um, recipes to 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 desire in the right way. 
And and why do we need to have? Why do we need to desire in the right way? Well, if we if we do not desire in the right way, then we go into competition and rivalry. If you get too much competition and rivalry on the tribal level, then everybody starts having conflict with everybody. Then you have this nation, this tribe-wide conflict. And the, the only way to, to, to get rid of that is in, in primitive societies is that basically to get to go to this, this scapegoat mechanism, right? So, so you have these 10 commandments that are indeed kind of like shaping, shaping desire. And so what you're saying right now is that, well, we don't really have those, those religious frameworks anymore to shape desire, but now we have kind of like, uh, you know, it's shaped tr through technology, basically. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that you, can, you, you, can, you can kind of put it that way. Huh? Yeah, that, that's an interesting way of, of, uh, of, of looking at it. Um, but then you can wonder, so, well, maybe, maybe that means that, um, well, if you kind of take a look at it, at, I mean, it's kind of just freewheeling here a bit, right? So, but, so these, these religions, they've basically been, been, been streamlined for, for thousands and thousands of years. And if you had a bad religion, well, you know, your tribe would probably just, probably actually, they would probably just kill themselves, right? Yep. Through internal conflict. So, so let's hope that our algorithms are... Uh, I mean, we might we might have some kind of uh, some kind of culling of of, uh, of algorithms. Yeah, yeah. But then the question is, well, let's hope that we don't have any any. Uh, um, well, we can't afford too many accidents, right? With the current technology that is around, with uh, uh, nuclear weapons and things like that. So if we if we if we fuck it up, then there might not be another chance to develop better technology to keep the desire in check, right? Precisely, I agree. I think if we look at it from the mundane point of view and, and exclude the religious and the supernatural, so to speak, religions had the same social regulating function. In other words, they told people how to desire that today technology has, namely the news, the social networks, the, the dominating regime of truth, the dominating discourse of everyday life, you know, baseline reality that is shared among everyone. And the greatest, perhaps, dictate of this baseline reality is it doesn't only tell you, <laughs> it doesn't tell you what to desire, precisely on the opposite. It, it, it forces you to desire in a specific way. This is what Zizek means when he says the, when he speaks about the the dictatorship to enjoy. You must mm -hmm. enjoy. And, and this to me is not the oppression of you cannot have this, which is perhaps this old oppressive way of thinking things, but it's the opposite. It's the oppression of you must enjoy, you must desire in this way. That is obviously why Deleuze speaks about schizoanalysis as a way to break free from this pre-prescribed path. But I guess I'm not making things any easier. Um. Yeah, I, I think I want to follow up a bit with, with uh, so I don't really think that technology can, can, can do this uh, yeah. properly. Because if you, if you look at how people are behaving, like one of, the, one of the characteristics of the social media age is the emergence of the, of the online mobs, right? The internet mobs. Of course. And um, so... So, so basically, people just revert to these these very old patterns. These are religious patterns, right? So people basically are without religion, and what and what they do is they basically revert to the the default religion, and that is, um, well, if there's conflict, we will find a scapegoat and we will go after the scapegoat. So, so all these technology, all these technologies that are around, they are not really addressing the problem because we can see these these very destructive patterns popping up everywhere. And that's because, I mean, it's basically what Nietzsche uh, talked about, right? God is dead, which was not a, a triumphant, uh, um, uh, not something that he said triumphantly, but he said, like, this is going to be a huge problem, right? And, uh, and another thing that he said, like, when he, when he talked about Christianity as a slave religion, right? So slave morality and this and that. I mean, it's only now I think that it's becoming clear what Nietzsche means, right? Because a lot of these mobs, so they basically, they're kind of like people who are, who are indulging in ancient paganism. And they're using Christian morality as an excuse. <laughs> this is like quite hilarious, actually. You know, they're, 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 there's this typical Christian concern of protecting the victim, right? 
So this is a Christian thing. You know, the Romans, they, they wouldn't understand this, right? Oh, I'm being oppressed. You know, uh, I'm a, I'm, you know, injustice is being done to me. No, Romans, they would just say like, so? I mean, they wouldn't care. You're a slave, motherfucker. You're a slave. You know, what, what, what are you talking about? You're a slave. I mean, they, they wouldn't even understand what you're trying to say, right? What, but Christians, they, they, they kind of have, have developed a certain way of being, where, where they, they, and, and I think rightfully so. They, they have uh, developed an understanding that, well, it's important to protect, uh, to pre- to protect the weak, to protect victims uh, against, against oppressors, against torture and stuff like that. And, and I think that was a very important innovation. But nowadays, but anything can be used against itself, right? So nowadays you have like, you have like this, uh, paradoxically speaking, uh, paradoxically. So this, 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 this very Christian concern for the victim is not being used to create mobs that go after victims. It's, 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 it's quite, it, the, the irony is, is incredible. You get these so unconscious hyper-Christians that are, that are forming uh, uh, cyber mobs to kill scapegoats. So it's kind of like it's it's kind of at the core it's paganism. So it's at the core it's like people are going to go after the kick of being in a pagan mob, and there there is this little varnish of uh, of of ethics that that comes from from uh, the demise of Christianity basically. So that's Gerard had a name for this, right? Like he called this sacrificial Christianity. Like he pointed out that this has existed throughout the two thousand years of Christianity. It's like whenever someone tries to make the 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 atheist critique of religion that religion just legitimizes war like look how many people were killed in let's just take the crusades for example Mm -hmm. or the fucking catholics versus the protestants in europe like how many people died in the name of a religion that was supposedly about peace and care for the weak and then well the gerardian point is no this is exactly another example of the complete perversion of the teachings because this archaic pattern is so easy to fall into there's the bad guys over there or the bad guy over there. We go kill them. And then we, we have a harmony. It's like, I suppose that's, that's the strength of war in a sense. War between nations helps to enforce the sense that there is a nation. We have to defend ourselves against those guys. So at least temporarily, we have a reason to cooperate instead of to, to fight amongst ourselves. Yeah. So we've established that sacrificial Christianity is ultimately the engine is sclaven morale. So, Thomas, what do you think it takes to have or to create master morality? Oh, dear. Yeah, this is kind of like, you know, this, this, uh, this Nietzschean uh, sense of, you know, uh, um, with the overman and stuff like that, and, and will to power and stuff like that. But Nietzsche was actually was actually uh, very much speaking about uh, mastery over the self, mm. mastery over your own, um, let's say your own uh, um, resentment, ressentiment, as he called it. Um, I, I would actually say it's against uh, mastering your own um, pagan, archaic, uh, primitive, dysfunctional uh, tendencies. I think that's that's basically. Um, I think that's basically a, a will to power is also the power over over the self, um, uh, and and also just recognizing these patterns because these patterns that you see. So a lot of a lot of people who go against their political adversaries, they cannot say like, well, it's their fault. You know, they are doing stuff that is evil and wrong, and if these people wouldn't be there, then everything would be better. I think that's completely wrong. I think that basically it's, uh, I mean, that's also a very Hegelian way of thinking, right? Uh, I, uh, oh, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've been lying a bit. I've been reading a bit of Hegel. So, but, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's good to, to look at the patterns that are, that are there all over the place in yourself, in, your, in the adversaries, and, and especially in the relationship between, between group A and group B, right? Whether, whether you belong to group A, group A or group B. Because, again, because of mimetic desire, because you copy each other all the time, you have the tendency, your behavior has a tendency to be defined by your adversary's behavior. Mm-hmm. So this is the whole thing. If you look into the abyss, the abyss looks, looks into you, right? Yes. Yeah. As you design, so it designs you in return. It's the, it's the whole loop of... The, yeah. Of, yeah. And this is interesting. Um, Nietzsche might have been an accelerationist. Why? Because the abyss, 
the staring into okay i'm gonna like okay, go well, you have to unpack that a bit for me what, what's I, I i've heard of it but i'm I, accelerationist is kind of like uh, isn't that something like like let's make everything go to hell so that that something else can appear is not is, is that correct or about when i'm caricaturing it of course but yeah enlighten me a bit here i'm freewheeling a bit and i'm also being a little uh, free with using the terms but i think my main point is okay step one if there's a relationship that exists you know if you look into the abyss the abyss looks into you uh, if we design our tools, they design us in return. My morality is in a way related to the morality of my enemy. There's a certain reciprocity. There's a certain way of being in the world that is not so direct, but is very looped. There's a certain feedback loop, which is perhaps a very deep thing that we, we all should understand. Um, and then I guess that I want to revert back to Dugan. And Dugan once uh, was explaining his view of, and I think you'll, 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 you'll agree with this. He was explaining his view of master morality and sclaven morality. That the master morality, <clears throat> the slave imitates the master. And he either mm -hmm. follows or does the opposite of the master. You know, oh, I hate you or I will do exactly like you. It's like you, you like Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson, you hate him, whatever. He defines it. And, and what does the master do? He defines the morality. How? According to Dugan, by a certain confrontation against death, by a Heideggerian being unto death, by heroic actions that may or may not result with killing the master. In other words, if you take it to the Dunbar number tribe, perhaps those who were leading were those who were able to stand at the edge of this confrontation with death. I'm hypothesizing here. And as such, my final point, uh, number three, why is Nietzsche an accelerationist? Well, because he speaks about the overman. And the overman is he who looks at the abyss, has the master morality, and is able to stomach and digest it so as to emerge from the other side with a morality uh, that is able to, to take care of it. Because in this sense, I believe Dugan is wrong in how he says that uh, we need to go back. No. Accelerationism for me, in my interpretation, is the only way is through. There's no way, there's no going back now. You know, we have to go through, uh, but through what? That's the big question. That's why we have no masters today. That's why we're trying to have this conversation and trying to figure out like, what does it take to invent a proper new morality that is worthy of being mimicked? Because I would say that a master morality is naturally mimicked. The truth in a land of falsities might be a trump card. I don't know if I'm being too hopeful here. What do you guys think? Well, there's a lot. There's there's a lot of uh, yeah. There's the. That was a to unpack. I think the Overman. So, I mean, if you read Nietzsche, then the Overman is. Uh, um, it sounds a bit like uh, I don't know if if uh, if I understood it correctly, but it it sounds very much like the overman is kind of put as, as somebody who's who is uh, who is powerful and 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 um, and um, it's kind of like the classical uh, interpretation of Nietzsche in, in the in, in, by by Nazi Germany, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's at all what Nietzsche meant with the overman, right? Somebody who's who's powerful and and leads the you know like like you know. Uh, I don't know, like a, a Hitler or a Lenin or whatever, you know, somebody who leads the masses. I think that's, a, that's the wrong way to look at the overman. I think that the over, Nietzsche's overman is a person who went beyond, beyond his own, uh, let's say, archaic, um, hedonistic, simplistic drives, and, and also somebody who dares to stand up to the mob. So somebody who, who doesn't basically just go along with, with you know, with, with, uh, with basically these, these, these group dynamics that most people are just just floating in right so mm -hmm. the the overman is actually somebody who, who i mean i think the overman often dies as i think the ultimate overman was jesus christ as a scapegoat right because he basically he basically scapegoat he was scapegoated and in that way so this is again a girardian way of thinking so so uh so christ was was scapegoated he was killed so that so from a conventional point of view that that's not very <laughs> that's not very overman right it's not very mastery or uh, master whatever so so but but by doing that he exposed the scapegoat mechanism itself and 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 thereby basically conquered this whole mob thinking 
So, so even though this person itself had no, no power, even though that person yes. died in a terrible way, was tortured to death by a mob, in the end, there is some kind of enormous victory in there. So, and I think that is, so, and that's the paradox with Nietzsche, right? I mean, Nietzsche was very much against the, you know, Christianity. Well, Nietzsche was against a certain way. I think he was, again, he was against what Owen called sacrificial Christianity. That's, again, yeah. something that Girard came up with, right? So, and, and I think that Nietzsche talked about sacrificial Christianity. Yeah. That Christianity is very, very, uh, that he was very against. Uh, but in the end, Nietzsche, um, Nietzsche signed this as a, right before he went crazy. Um, I think the last 10 years of his life, he, he, he was basically, um, he was basically just uh, sitting in a, in a sofa and a, um, basically being a plant, right? But right before that <laughs> happened, he, he, he signed the letter, um, the crucified one. Hmm. By the way, suddenly, it's as if he kind of suddenly kind of realized the, or it's a very strange thing that happened to him in the end, right? So I mean, he was styling himself both as the crucified one and as Dionysus. That's the kind yes. of bizarre thing. Yeah. Right? That's why uh, Nietzsche is very tantric, right? The thing is, Nietzsche is, uh, is the Nietzsche is the the, uh, the Western tantric. That's fantastic. I just want to say that Christian uh, huh, Nietzsche might have been more Christian than the Christians in that. Yes. I, I consider Nietzsche a, a great Christian prophet. Yeah. Right. I, uh, oh, now we're being Hegelian again. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a rule book of how to pretend to do philosophy. One of them is to say, to be more leftist than the leftists and to be more <laughs> Christian than the Christians. And if you do am this... Am I doing it right? Yeah. Maybe in a couple of years I can, uh, I can aspire to be a philosopher. Or... Look, this negate is, uh, every, this is what Zizek every has been doing for 20 years. So... We can <laughs> we can follow his advice. No, I think Nietzsche had this beautiful thing where, where, where I you know his definition by meditating against death properly. I believe that it is possible for someone to invent a morality that is able to uh, that people will want to mimic because meditation against death is meditation against reality, and the reality principle is is is, is kind of rules all. So my opinion is that. Whenever someone aligns with death and or reality, then they will automatically produce a morality. Uh, and, I and think it's just making yourself a bit more humble and a bit less invested in your own egoic attachments and desires, right? It's like, if I know I'm going to die, then what does it matter so much whether I get this shiny new jumper or not? Just to finish off, like, I think... I don't think so. I think it's about uh, what the mass morality to me refers to is about playing at a game that is not the game of the of everyone. It's a game outside of the game. So while everyone is playing the Sklav and Morale game that has rules such as the metic desire and the mob and all these conflicts, that there are the few, Nietzsche might have been one and Jesus might have been one, who, who end up having the, this power to go above to the abyss and snatch something that is going to be morally impactful. And we all know the moral impact of Nietzsche and the moral impact of Jesus in societies. So that's, that's I guess, my point. But look, this is what I mean. The moral impact is that they are <laughs> less involved in their own just obsessions and their own desires. And so we're actually able to serve the community a bit better. I think that's why these guys like Jesus or perhaps Nietzsche would be a model for action because it's like, oh, if I could be loving and open or if i could be joyful and dispense with all of my resentment then i'd be a better human being i'd be better to be around i'd be more enjoyable more productive like a, a better member of my community i think Nietzsche said that he wanted to be humble and a member of his own community i think he was just he went to the abyss and then he came back and then he had this extremely uh, impactful thing to say that was in in many ways just just in the, in the same way that Jesus said, I come not to bring peace, but the sword. I think that that's Nietzsche. Yeah, they bring this idea that only a hundred years later, we're starting to like realize J Jesus's ideas took like 300 years. Um, I think what I'm kind of trying to get is I'm mindful of attempts to read philosophy as like producing some kind of superhuman who's above everybody else yeah. in the same way of being mindful of like, 
say spiritual or mystical practices that give you that kind of transcendent sense of I'm up in the God realm. I'm like, I'm elated and I'm, I'm above everybody else. I'm somehow superior. It's like philosophy can be manipulated in that way. So I think that's precisely what happens with Nietzsche and the, uh, and the fascists, for example. I think that's also, like I mentioned earlier, kind of how the traditionalists jump on the idea of a hierarchical society because yeah. basically of course they're all priests and they live in a decadent society that's got no space for priests anymore and so they're not at the top but really we're the priests and we should be at the top i mean to use like one of alexander bard's ideas like obviously he's talking about this small segment of shamanic people within society there's an element i think of this is almost like one of the shamans decides he should be running a show yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody comes up with this. Instead of sitting out in the forest doing his thing, whacking off and drinking frog juice. Whenever you hear anyone whacking about integralist theory, nine times out of ten, they will consider themselves at the higher level. And I agree with your point. The ability to go beyond to the abyss and extract this massive morality is not for who wants, it's for those who are able. And I would say you have like, you know, three in the history for all time or, or something like that. It, it's, it's extremely hard. Um, but I agree with you. Nobody comes up with structures where they're not at the top, which might lead us to ask Tom about tantrism and, and, and sutra. And, and I know that you, you are very knowledgeable about these things, Tom. So how do you, how do you find the relationship between, you know, tantra, sutra and desire? How does this play into your, into your thinking, into your understanding? Because I, I have to admit, I, I know very little about tantra, sutra, Eastern things. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. so i don't know if you if you if you want to riff off of that yeah yeah sure sure that's that's uh yeah that, that's a great interest uh, of mine uh, um uh, especially tantric buddhism um so 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 in in uh in uh, in buddhism you have like um you have like 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 two two um forms of buddhism so you can you have the sutric buddhism and you have tantric buddhism and both of these are are very much um uh, Buddhism is, is very much concerned with the question of, of desire. So just like Christianity, uh, basically, but the, the, the Christianity is very much focused on, on uh, the scapegoat mechanism. So Christianity is exposed to scapegoat mechanism. That's the heart of Christianity, basically. I mean, it, you know, Christianity has nothing to do, well, at least in my book, you know, I mean, believe in, in life after death and all of these things, you know, the, these kind of layers of superficial stuff. You know, Christianity is basically about, you know, like, do not form mobs and kill scapegoats. That's kind of that's kind of it. That's kind of Christianity, right? Look, look, this this there was this guy, and he really didn't deserve to die, but he was killed by this scapegoat mechanism because that's what people do. They form mobs and then they kill scapegoats because that's a way to kind of appease the tension in in a society. And there's something evil about it. Let's not go there. That's kind of Christianity in a nutshell. And Buddhism. Buddhism has, uh, is, is, is different in the sense that it basically looks at, look at the problem of desire. Desire gets us into a lot of trouble. We're going to look at the heart of desire. We're going to examine desire. We're going to take a look at it very, very deeply. And we're going to do that very, very much also do, uh, 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 using introspection, things like meditation and stuff like that. So, so that's basically the thing with Buddhism. So that's just my opinion, right? I'm, I'm sure that uh, I would be, um, I might be crucified by, by a Tibetan Lama, but anyway, I'll take the, I'll take crucified. the chance. Right? Ah. So, and, and within Buddhism, so there are two ways of doing that. So first you have the, the sutric way of looking at desire, and that is we're going to do renunciation, right? So we're going to give up desire. So we're going to meditate upon the, let's say, the, the, the human body, right? So let's say that you are, you are a very uh, sensual person and you have desire for women. Well, you're going to meditate on the human body as a sack full of organs and, and blood and pus and this and that. You're going to literally uh, sit in front of a corpse and meditate on a corpse. So these are practices that are being done in Sutric Buddhism, right? So it's renunciation. We're going to give up desire. We're going to, to set limits to it. We're also going to re renunciate uh, anger and this and that. So that's a sutric way of being. Now, does that work? <laughs> Up to a point for some people. But this is going to be a, uh, this is going to be a path that is, um, in many ways, it's going to work if you're, if you're a monk in a, in, a, in a forest and stuff like that. But, you know, this is, this is kind of very difficult to do if you, have, if you are an ordinary person and you, uh, and you have an, a life uh, that, that, that uh, includes 
uh, being among, among other people and dealing with daily life, right? So mm -hmm. then there's another way of, of dealing with things, and that's, that's basically a, that's tantric Buddhism. And there you are going to, um, you, you are going to, again, look at desire very, very closely, but there you're going to say, well, what about examining desire again? Mm. And what about making it work? And accepting it completely and accepting all the, all the, the things that come with desire, that is rivalry, anger, fear, competition, and all of these things, and basically develop a, a very practical, skillful way of being to deal with all the complications that arise with desire. So that would basically be the, the, the tantric attitude. In practice, these two are coupled. You need to do, but you cannot do tantra without sutra. You can do sutra without tantra if you're a monk and stuff like that, but you cannot do tantra without sutra. They have to be coupled. So in some ways you're going to practice renunciation. And in some ways you are actually going to really jump into the, into the cauldron of desire. And you're going to, to make that work. You're going to develop a way of being that, that can deal with, with, uh, with intense desire. How would you do sutra and tantra at the same time? Then? Like, would that be something like not drinking alcohol except on occasions and then getting really fucked up? <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, like there's a very different, there's very, you know, like, yeah, actually that's a, that's a very, that's a very good, good uh, why not? That's a good, very good illustration. I mean, there's something in between uh, being an alcoholic or being a teetotaler, right? There's something that's neither. And it's in between. It's like you don't go to the extremes. You learn how to deal with, with, this, with this tricky substance that is alcohol. That would be a tantric attitude. Yeah. Tantra yeah. and Sutra, uh, as I was hearing you, I was making this connection. It sounds like behaviorism. It sounds like positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Although addressed, uh, they have their differences, but um, you know, punishment and reward. Um, do you give in to desire? Or are you supposed to be renunciating, restraining, or even punished for following it? Does Sutra contain any punishment, for example? Any punishment? Yeah. Like, oh, shit, um, I shouldn't. No, I wouldn't say so. No, it, it's, not, not, uh, it's not like Christianity with its concept of sin and things like that. Okay. Um, but it, it, but it, it, it does uh, talk in terms of, for example, uh, renunciate your anger, give up your anger. Uh, so so it, it, like, well, while, while in Tantra, you'd say, like, well, no. We're going to use the, the energy that is behind anger. Anger is clarity. So that would be a tantric way of, of, uh, of thinking, right? So, you know, anger is a form of clarity. So, and I'm going to use, when I'm angry, I'm going to make use of this energy to do something, to you know, do some constructive action. That would be a tantric attitude. And this, this stuff is, uh, so rather, so if you want to read on this, right, read Nietzsche. Nietzsche is constantly talking about these things. He, one in, in Alza's Prakta Zarathustra, he has, a, he has one of his, uh, his chapters is about um, once you had wild dogs in your cellar, uh, but now they, they turned into, uh, into be beautiful songbirds. And, and that's, that's how he put basically all these, these pesky emotions, these, these things that are unacceptable, anger, fear, resentment. Somehow they turned from, from obstacles and problems into... into, um, into uh, uh, let's say things that, that power you, that, that empower you, and things that lead to lead to action. It's fantastic. It's like we're discussing frameworks for transmutation of desire. Um, yeah, t t t t tantra is often uh, described as the transformation of desire. Yeah. Okay. Well, what would you do with with sorrow? With, with what? Sadness. So, if anger brings clarity, what does sadness or sorrow bring? Sadness. Well. Um, well, uh, for example, that, that brings you a lot of, uh, th that brings you uh, uh, empathy. Mm. For example, I mean, the, the, the best way to, uh, to deal with, with uh, sorrow is to uh, help people who are in the same situation because you, you know what it is like, so you can relate and you, you have experience. But there are no, Tantra is not so much a, a set of, so it's always, diff I always find it very difficult about Tantra because it's kind of like, um, you cannot kind of, it's not just a set of simple rules to follow. Um, so that's mm -hmm. why, why Tantra often makes use of a guru, which is basically so you can kind of see how is that person in the world? How is that person? And then you can kind of say, oh, so that's why it's very difficult to get it from a book. So usually mm -hmm. it's kind of transferred via, via personal contact. So you can kind of see how, how is that, wow, look at that way of being, how that person acts in that situation. Um, and, uh, and then the important thing is that you should not copy because that doesn't work. 
So that's what, you know, the, the standard, you know, new age guru, you know, the abusive guru, that, that, that's kind of like creating little copies, right? So it, it doesn't work like that. You have to kind of, you, you look at these people and say like, well, they have a way of being that is extraordinary and it's, you cannot copy it. The, what you can see is like, you can, can kind of look at them and go like, well, there are ways of being that are less constrained and more, let's say, let's say open, open-ended than what I thought was possible. But I'll have to find my own way of doing that. I cannot copy that from anybody. Fantastic. And I would say that just very shortly that that happens because in order to attain a certain mass and morality, one does not look outward, but one looks inwards, if you will. You cannot copy someone else's mass and morality. That's slave morality by definition. You have to perhaps go through the very hard process of, of attaining it. Uh, but that's again the Nietzschean idea of mastering the self, right? It's, it's, you know, it's not so much, Nietzsche was not so much about, it was not at all, in fact, about mastering others. It was very much against nationalism and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, uh, anti-Semitism and things like that. So it was not about, oh, I'm going to pose my will on a lot of people. <laughs> that was not what Nietzsche was about. It was very much about also conquering yourself and conquering your own, uh, your own resentment uh, with respect to life in the face of suffering and things like that. Uh, Nietzsche was very much, uh, uh, he suffered a lot, right? He had a terrible health. And uh, he was in pain a lot and uh, he, often he couldn't write. And so that's one of the reasons why he wrote such short texts. Right? Nietzsche writes, writes very short aphorisms and stuff like that it's because he couldn't write for, very long, uh, for a very long period. He had to take breaks all the time. And that's it. Yeah. To bring it back to the beginning, though, then, uh, if tant- what it sounds to me is like Tantra and Sutra seem to be these, these, these frameworks for how to become a master moral, for how to be in this position of a priest someone who um, has faced the abyss on their own and is able to perhaps uh, provide their own morality for themselves. Now, perhaps beneath that, since we're talking religious terms, we're talking case terms, we're talking structure terms, perhaps beneath that, and for the Sklaven morale, for the majority of, the, of people, there seems to me to be the necessity for the minor gods, in the words of Alexander Barr, or rather, mm-hmm. you know, there's a few frameworks and methodologies to manage the desire of the masses, and I hate the word the masses, but it's useful, so I'll use it. Namely, you know, what, what, what you, Freud has three in, in civilization and its discontents. He says that there is what the monks do, which is channeling, diverting. Libido happens to me. I try to, you know, I do farming, I do renunciation and all that. That's one. Second one is substances. You know, you drink beer and you get high and you, you renounce the pain of existence because of that. And then the third one, satisfactions by substitution, like art, like movies. So you put yourself, your libido gets vicariously transformed by looking at the, what the hero does, what the master does, what the king does. Um, again, by mimicking somehow, even if it's a passive mimicking, you're just looking towards them. And uh, I don't, having made this framework, I want to throw the conversation to, the, to AI because it seems to me that while this case system has been more or less stable until 1900, the point of arrival of modernity, the traditionalists uh, bitch about this day and night, the point of arrival of modernity has been the point where this has, you, we, okay, what do we do now, right? We're fucked. And today, even more, micro-targeting has made satisfaction by substitution a fucking wormhole in itself. Mm. It's no longer to manage society. It's, it's to be enslaved purely and simply. Uh, substances, similar, uh, even the channeling. So my point, being, uh, my point being desire today and its management and the frameworks that we use for its management is so enmeshed, is so interconnected. There's so lack of clarity. Um, well, I didn't want to reach a dead end in this comment, but I think that's what I just reached. Yeah, but so that's yeah. Um, there's certainly reason to 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 be pessimistic and to point out uh, things that are uh, things are terrible. Um, but then again, I mean, when were they not terrible? Fair enough. I mean, if, I mean, things are always terrible in, in with humans. I mean, it's always been you know bloodshed and and massacre and and sudden death uh, uh, around the corner. I mean, it's always been like that. And the second thing is that I mean, what I do find, I mean, I'm, I'm actually tremendously optimistic <laughs> i don't know why but i am tremendously optimistic and if you look around right you go to amazon 
the entire 2,000 years of our more knowledge is just there for 20 euros, right? Yeah. I mean, whatever piece of knowledge you want, you, you probably can get it for under 50 euros, right? We are talking about, you know, a 14th century text, Tibetan Buddhism, Long Champa, which until, uh, you know, maybe a couple of decades ago was super, super secret and was only given to you after 20 years of study. Now you can find uh, by the nice, uh, you know, hard bound copy for 50 euros and it's yours. And you can just study Long Champa as long as you want. And you can do that with anything. You can do that with Hegel, even. You can do that with Nietzsche. You can do that. You can buy anything from anybody now. Uh, and, and people are using it. I mean, you guys are a good example, right? So you, 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 kinda, you have conversations with philosophers. You study philosophy. All of this knowledge is available to you, and you are using it. And I see a lot of people using it. A lot of people are, you know, they, they are, okay, maybe it's Jordan Peterson. You can, whatever you think of Jordan Peterson, at, at least. I mean, I mean, this is talking about, about Jung and about... Uh, uh, about other philosophers and thinkers and stuff like that. And then on the, on the other side of the political spectrum, they have their heroes and they are thinking and there's this big battle going on. I mean, there's a, a huge exchange of ideas that is unparalleled in the history of human beings. Now, where this is going, I don't know. I have no idea, but it's damn interesting. And there might actually become uh, come very new, new ways of being out of this. Fantastic. Quick comments. Uh, then I'm going to throw it to you on um, what you just what you, what you just described to me. It's always been terrible. What do you want? That's beautiful because to me that's incipient master morality for an age of exodus. Exodus, as we often discuss in our mailing list, which we share, this idea that we've reached a point in history where the old vessels are no longer useful and we need to depart in search of new ones. Vessels for morality, vessels for being, for life. So what is this incipient morality? I, we don't know what it is. We don't know what it's going to be. But we know that it's not something static that you receive, like in the tables made in stone, but as a process. What is that morality? I don't know. But I know that going to Amazon is a good thing. And having access to all this information, that's, that's all right. And as such, it's processes, it's flows. Very Deleuzian again. So just wanted to throw that. Yeah, well, I mean, like the beautiful and thing to be optimistic about is precisely this, that you can get long Changpa from Amazon for 50 euros. But then the flip side of it is the, um, the QAnon effect and the conspiracy, conspiracy effect, the conspirituality effect. The, um, for every person reading a 14th century Tibetan text that they've gotten, there's a hundred more doing basically like gorilla peasant epistemology, trying to make sense of what the fuck's going on in an increasingly automated world, basically with a few words and symbols that someone else who's an anon has used on a screen. And it's, <laughs> it's chaos, right? It's QAnon shamans in the capital, which is like a total <laughs> LARP of, the revolutions that happened in the past two centuries, but there's still, that's kind of the point. They're just throwing it on totally postmodern, throwing on symbols and acting out scenes that have happened before, but with absolutely <laughs> no contact with anything that seems to make much sense. There's just some kind of general paranoid core that there's, <laughs> there's a mess. Things are out of control. There must be someone, someone pulling the strings and we've got to try and work it out by, <laughs> but like I said, by doing this like decentralized guerrilla peasant epistemology. And that fucking frightens me. Rebel Wisdom did a great film on this a, uh, a couple of weeks ago about the conspirituality effect and about this like increasing overlap between the new age spiritual world and the, um, the conspiracy world. And one of the guys, again, on this mailing list Daniel mentioned, a, a guy called Alex Ebert is doing this like great analysis of the type of personality structure that is attracted to a particularly kind of new age person, uh, new age spirituality, very transcendentalist, very about being the master of your own destiny, control, law of attraction. Everything is within your grasp if you just visualize it. And then that person also coming up against the hard reel of... <laughs> of economics against coronavirus and thinking well 
if I can't have the, uh, the flourishing ego that I desire, that I think I can manifest for myself, it must be because there's something happening behind the scenes. There's someone pulling the strings and we need to get to the bottom of the conspiracy because if I know what, what the conspiracy is, then I've got the control again, right? The ego is back in control. Either you're in control or you know who's in control and then you're in control by kind of proxy. But how, how yeah, I mean... Sure. I mean, it's not all, uh, it's not all roses. <laughs> well, no, like you said, it's, it's always been a mess. <laughs> but again, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you always have these, you know, crazy ideas running through societies and, you know, mobs uh, running amok and things like that. But, um, uh, but even I mean, the thing is, if you, if you, if you look at these QAnon people, right, I mean, they have, I mean, they, they are highly educated compared to a couple of hundred of years ago, right? They all know how to read and write and they know arithmetic and this and that. I mean, just the fact that what we take for granted is, is like, I mean, the, the amount of, of education that, that, that is now in, in the world is just enormous. And I think that, so again, I'm, I'm also very worried about mobs and all of that stuff and, and, you know, destruction and ecological catastrophe and this and that. But I mean, humanity has always been, been subject to these types of forces, to delusional ideas sweeping through societies, um, mobs, uh, diseases, uh, you know, uh, that it's always been like, I don't think it will ever, ever change. It will mm -hmm. always be like that. Let me ask, what's the cutting edge of AI right now? The cutting edge of AI? Um, well, um, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, like, what is... There's so much now that is mind-boggling. I mean, it's like... <laughs> it's a difficult question. I mean, I guess so the layperson probably knows artificial intelligence. You can do... You can draw massive data sets or mm -hmm. optimize algorithms to search images or, I guess, deep fakes, like creating artificial video content or artificial sound content is increasingly on the horizon. But I'm wondering if, as someone who, like studies this and works on this full time there's stuff that you kind of see in your periphery that isn't known to the layperson yet that is going to be shaking things up wildly in the next okay decade. it's going to be a bit of a boring uh, answer maybe but uh, i think it's important that is that uh, so um what what so, so there's basic ai is, is is currently not so good with dealing with uncertainty so with noisy data with missing data with uh, you know experimental uncertainty and stuff like that and so one of the one of the big developments in in ai is to to make um ai probabilistic so so that it can deal with with noisy data with uncertainty and so like you have this famous uh that this this um so for example in if if you're dealing with a with a driving car right you you don't you want to know probabilities you know what's the probability that this object in front of you is a is a human or 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 a, or a or a cat or or just a plastic bag right so you want to integrate all the sources of uncertainty that 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 you that you that you have so that you can not only give answers right so it's it's this or it's that but you can also say well, it's this and i'm that certain of it Right. So, and and that's one 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 uh, one thing that that currently is uh, is 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 uh, is a very big development in the AI. So basically, making sure that uh, that that. Uh, but maybe this is a very technical answer. You might have wanted something a bit more <laughs> more juicy. But for the rest, you can just you know open your browser and then just uh, Google to all the all the all the fantastic things that are going on, like self-driving cars, protein structure prediction by DeepMind. Uh, uh, you know the language models uh, that are not being used for all kinds of purposes. So it's it's quite amazing. Yeah. I guess one one thing that I want to ask you on that is uh, since you know you're, you're obviously um, in the area. I do UX design in in artificial intelligence as well. And one thing that I want to ask you is, you know, currently we have narrow AIs, narrow machine learning, solving these specific problems. You just mentioned that we can use probabilistic AI. To navigate these uncertain data sets, to navigate the noise, and to perhaps solve that problem better, how is it gonna like transit to the sci-fi Alexander Bard Synthism AGI artificial general intelligence? You know, is it gonna be all of these AIs, one here solving an error problem, one here solving an error problem, and they all network mm -hmm. at the end of the day? Do you think that's that's gonna be the pathway? Well, yeah, um, 
it seems that currently the, the most successful, well, currently the most successful algorithms are very much, um, they're kind of like algorithms, AI algorithms that work within their narrow field of application. So you, of course you have, for example, all these, these uh, uh, very big language models that are used for all kinds of applications, but it's still, you know, it's a very similar application. So I don't know how close we are to, to something like an artificial general intelligence. Um, and I also don't know whether, I mean, we will have enough problems and enough revolutions and enough mind boggling thing with, with, with uh, problem specific AI. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it's, you don't really need an artificial general intelligence to kind of have all kinds of, you know, mind boggling developments. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. I think we just, uh, if we put these things in the hands of super genius desire marketers, then uh, those will be the new wars of the 21st century, right? Well, well, I mean, there's, there's, what I do see is that there's, there's less and less work for, or there's more and more work for less, less and fewer and fewer people, right? Uh, everything is, well, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, this is all very well known, right? But it's quite spectacular. You can see like, okay, well, this user, like, for example, I mean, you have the field of the, my field, like protein structure prediction. So this, I, I apply uh, artificial intelligence to protein structure prediction. And a, a lot of the, so recently with the success of DeepMind, so a lot of the, of the research programs are now becoming redundant, right? Because, well, there's now this, 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 this is now the, the baseline performance level, right? And so there's a lot of, a lot of, of uh, uh, a lot of people are, will either need to find a new way of working with the field or, or find a new field or, or, or otherwise it will become redundant, right? And this is, this is just, this is going at an alarming pace. It's much going much faster than people realize, I think. And the, the pandemic only made it, made it worse, right? Because not, not thanks to the pandemic companies, um, companies are now, now investing big time in robotics and things like that because humans are, are now being seen for what they are, liabilities. So at the end of the, of the pandemic, a lot more people are going to be redundant. So, and then, of course, we're back to the topic where we were, right? So what are all these people going to do when they are not needed in society? What are you going to do when you have like millions and millions of people who are, who have no, are of no use whatsoever? They're not just going to sit at home doing nothing, right? I mean, they're going to find, they're going to find some meaning in their life. And that yeah. means they are going to develop their own religion. And that means the easiest way of doing religion, that is to make a mob, to go to pagan religion, sacrificial religion. That means you unite against something you hate You find an abject. That's Kristeva's idea, right? Uh, Yulia Kristeva. Um, you find something to hate and you, you unite uh, around this object of hate. And then you can, you can basically indulge in the, in the, the, you know, the benefits of the, of the ancient religion of paganism. So that's a way to read woke, right? It's a bunch of bored middle class people who have no religion and who basically and who are bored and who are at home and who are not doing very well, and they basically find the religion, and they they find the default. They stumble upon the ancient religion, the ancient form of religion. Yeah, that's in my opinion the best way to understand what's going on. Yeah. That's why I find Girard such an uh, such a fantastic thinker. So this is basically, you know, the discovery of mind, right? As Walter Kaufman called it. And, and Freud has been working on that and Jung and Adler and uh, Lacan and, and all of these people, um, they basically all were working on, on the same problem. So why do people behave the way they do? And I think that Girard has found, the, as far as I know, Girard has, has, has uh, come across the best explanation. Mimetic desire, it explains so much. Fantastic. You know, as you were discussing the ever-increasing technological unemployment, I was thinking about that Davos guy. I don't know his name. But apparently, he's a meme now. Uh, the guy who said, you will own nothing and you will be happy for it because the world will be subscription models paid for with a universal basic income. And I was, as I was thinking of this, I'm like, you know, shit. It's just kicking the problem of the mob and of a medic desire and the scapegoat further down the road. Yeah, yeah. Just make power bigger, and and the outskirts. Well, just push it, push it out. Well, but it works. I mean, that's that's what capitalism does, right? So you you give people so much that they don't go into rivalry. Yeah. 
so that's one of the that's that's so capitalism and so christianity worked by the you know ten commandments so behave like this and that that way you will minimize uh, mimetic rivalry and capitalism basically did something else that like well we'll give each everybody so much that they don't have to go into rivalry over uh, simple things like food and stuff like that so everybody has that or nearly everybody at least in the west right so yeah so that's a capitalist solution so the problem is if we have a huge, let's say if we have an economic crisis and there is scarcity, then, then we will have a big time uh, rivalry again and we will not have a religion that streamlines that. I would say that, uh, you know, when Rome was falling, the sub emperor after emperor found themselves doubling and doubling and doubling the wage of the soldiers because it's good yes, for the soldiers. Good. Pay, but then you just double, 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 double. There's no more money. They rebel. Boom, it falls. And even today yeah. in the age where we have a lot of food, a lot of money, where, you know, universal basic income can take care of every material need for everyone, you know, capitalism has lifted people out of poverty like nothing ever before. What comes to mind is the dark hunger uh, that is exemplified in a Portuguese uh, story called the Nau Catrineta, which is basically this guy who is lost at sea. There's a bunch of dudes at sea and they're lost. And uh, basically... The captain tells a guy, oh, climb up, the, climb up the mast. I'll give you anything if you can find land. And he says, hey, dude, I see lands of Portugal, sands of Spain. I can see land. Oh, yes, we are here. We are there. Please take us there because everyone else is weak or something like that. And he says, no, you've promised uh, to give me everything. You know, you made me a promise. Now you'll have to keep it. And he's like, Come on, man, just take us, just take us home. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you all the money you can imagine. All the money that I have. No, uh, I will not do it because you've probably... So I'm basically butchering the story. But the whole point is that the captain was offering his land and was offering his daughter in marriage and was offering everything that he had to this character who was then denying fulfilling his promise of bringing them to land because he was actually the devil in the story. So what does this mean? It means that this hunger, even though you have everything, you can have everything, but the devil's hunger is always greater. You know, there's no oh, yeah, yeah. satanic in this sense. Like literally, technically satanic. Yeah, like, but there will be, even if you, that. yeah, in the sense that I think that if I get you correctly, so even if you give everybody um, what they need to live so that, that you basically remove a lot of reasons for rivalry, I mean, th there will be always be reasons to, to be envious and especially now in this age where we've, uh, we've uh, cross-linked everybody using the internet and you always, I mean, people are posting all these pictures, you know, uh, at their happiest peak, right? So that you always think like, oh, the others are having it better, right? Look, yeah. at, look at that person on Facebook that has perfect being, you know, sitting there on the beach in, uh, I don't know, Pong Pangyang or whatever, right? And, and I'm sitting here and of course you don't, you don't post pictures when you're, when you're hangover and depressed on a lonely Friday evening, right? Is you keep that away from, from Facebook, right? So, 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 yeah, you're right. I mean, there, there will always be reasons for rivalry because that's what we do. And we, 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 we have rivalry for, for things that don't exist, right? For prestige and stuff like that. You know, we, we, uh, and, and we, there's something called metaphysical desire, which is basically you, you, don't, you don't desire what other people have, you know, the car or the wife. You, you desire what other people are. You want to be that person. That's metaphysical desire. If you have that, then, that's, then you're fucked. Right? So you, you're not, you, you, you don't accept your own being. You want to be somebody else. You, you, because you know, look at that person with the perfect body, the perfect life, the perfect. So it's not just you want that, you want that physical, you want that materialistic thing, but actually you want that way of being. And that's the case with reality TV and the age of Instagram influencers now. It's like 50 years ago, the stars were at least in the movies or on the stage, there was an otherworldliness about them in the same way that once upon a time, the aristocrat is like, if I'm a peasant and you're a peasant and the queen is the queen, then it's like, well, she's the fucking queen, man. Like we're never going to fuck her. There's yeah. just no way in hell that's going to happen. Yeah. That's, but, a, that's a stratification, right? In society. So that, that you nowadays you, you compete with everybody, you know, the, 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 you can, you can be Facebook friends with somebody who's like, you know, 50 times, you know, or, uh, hundred thousand times richer than you right so and they're just they're just they're like you and you can see like well 
I can compete with that. Why don't I have 50 million euros in the bank? Like this guy, like my friend on Facebook. This kind of, this kind of competition, this was unthinkable 100 years ago. If you were a, if you were a worker, you know, you, you would, you would kind of like have ambitions within your working, within your circle of, you know, within your worker circle, right? Within your, and, and, and if you would, would be like, let's say like the, the, the aristocrats wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't compete with the royalty and all of that stuff. So it would be stratified. But nowadays everybody's competing with everybody. So again, apocalyptic times. It's funny, like you said, like you compete with everybody. Like that said by a liberal humanist is like a triumphant statement. Everybody gets the chance to compete with everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the very same statement in our conversation, it's like, oh God, I compete with everybody. But it's never been like that. This is very new. It's never been literally that, that you can, and, and you're quite right about the influencers and stuff like that. So now it's also like, you know, you have this metaphysical being and it's like, it's like spread on a, on a scale that is, it's never been like that. It's completely new. So you don't and, only but, desire what they have. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so that you don't only desire what they have, but how they have it. Deleuze said, if you're trapped in the dream of the other, you're fucked, which is another way to say if you engage in the dynamics of metaphysical desire, then... Yeah, and, and you always think like, well, I, I, feel, I feel like I lack. I'm not perfect. I, I am, there's things that I didn't do in my life. I lack things. I... I, I am. I have disappointments, but look at that person on Facebook. You know, always on the beach and this and that. You know, that person has perfect being. So that's metaphysical desire, and it's, it's this. So one of so one of the like 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 in Buddhism, right? So in 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 tantra, you realize that that there is no perfect being. So that's one. That's something that is very actually regardless of tantra, or whatever. I mean, that's a very important thing to to realize that there is no nobody has perfect being. No, David Bowie didn't have perfect being. Not, right. not even David Bowie. Nobody has perfect being. Everybody is on, on if you if you look from the inside, they would all lack. They would all feel inadequate and, and, and there's the same misery is everywhere. And this way of looking towards the other and feeling a certain lack and repeating this behavior sounds to me just it sounds to me like Christian ressentiment. It sounds to me like the joy of abstinence, of saying I do not engage in sex because I am so pure, like a Victorian person in the 19th century. I don't know if I'm making connections where they don't exist, but what it feels to me is that uh, even we come to desire... No, Walter Benjamin said, our own degradation becomes an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. We come to enjoy that this status of underling, of always being under something else. There's whole ideologies built out of this. Chassantiman. So Chassantiman in itself becomes a framework for desiring. Becomes a fucking software for the libido that says, you know, libido will flow here, here, and here, and here. And the character and the color, in this case, it tends to be very much around the lack. And that's how systems that are based around idolizing the minor gods work. Well, so, so that's, that's an, I think that we, I'd, I'd like to touch upon this because what you're describing is, is, um, is essentially sadomasochism, right? That's, that's really interesting. Yes. So yes. one of the things that I like about you, right, there's so many things that can be, this, that, that can be, you know, if you read Jung and you read Freud and Lacan and stuff like that, I mean, kind of, okay, good, this is all very interesting and stuff like that. But then you look at people's behavior and so like, I still don't understand why this is going on. But with, with Girard, I mean, this is really very parsimonious in, in the sense that the, it, it explains lots of sadomasochism. What's going on there, right? And we're talking about both consensual as, uh, you know, con the consensual sexual practice as the more like, you know, sadomasochism that is more like, uh, you know, non-consensual and destructive out there, right? But, but let's, let's actually go to, uh, go to the sexual theatrical uh, sadomasochism, right? Why do people do that? What's going on? Isn't that, that's kind of a, I mean, we all know that it's going on. We maybe practiced it ourselves and stuff like that. But how do you describe it? Why do people do that? Well, Girard has a very simple explanation. So, okay. If you go into rivalry about an object, right? So suppose that you are, you know, there's a one kilogram of gold, you know, somebody has it, the other person doesn't have it and you both want it. So the person who has it is going to defend it. The person who wants it is going to go into conflict with the person who has it, right? Let's say that the person who has it is the model, right? The, 
the model who has the, 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 the pot of gold and the, and the person who wants this is the subject, right? So we have the subject and the model. The model has it, the subject wants it, right? So basically the subject uh, and uh, um, so, so uh, okay, never mind. Uh, we, we don't have to complicate it, right? So mm -hmm. now what is characteristic for such, a, for such a relationship is that there's an object of desire the object is desired by two parties, the subject and the model, and there's a conflict between the subject and the model, right? Now, what you do in sadomasochism is you create this situation of, of conflict where somebody has it and somebody doesn't have it but is trying to get it. So, but there's no object. Because when you create a situation, your, your mind kind of automatically implies or automatically figures out there must be some kind of very very precious object around because i'm in this very in in this conflictual situation where there is a master and a slave so there's somebody who has the object that's of course the the sadist and there's uh, somebody who craves the object but doesn't get it it's forbidden by the by the sadist by the master mm -hmm. who is kind of acting like god who has the perfect thing so that's what's going on in sadomasochism and then you can see everywhere, right? You can see that in politics, you can see that in relationships, you can see that in groups of people. So is this creation of this, so it's as if, if normally uh, desire is triangular, so there's always like subject, object, uh, subject, uh, model, object, but in sadomasochism, there's no real object. It's as if the, the constellation of the, mo of the model and the subject is enough to create a virtual object out there. So the masochist is kind of... What are they? Would you say like denied their? I, I don't know. Like denied their freedom, denied a certain form of pleasure, or like. Well, they both don't, they both don't like each other. The masochist has a. They both lack in being. They don't have perfect being. They don't like their being. The masochist doesn't like their doesn't like their being because there's something missing. The sadist also doesn't like himself because there's something missing, right? So, but when they create their, 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 their funny relationship, right? The sadist can, can pretend uh -huh. he has it. And the masochist can pretend that, that he's close to it. Mm. So they both ha are happy temporarily because they created this fantasy situation where the masochist is close to getting something. I'm almost there. And the, the, the sadist can pretend that I have it and I'm not giving it to you. I have it. And the masochist kind of gets to like, I'm the instrument by which the person gets it. Yeah, so and, they, and their, their diet, so their, their relationship creates a balancing act where they both can pretend that they have or, or that they are close to perfect being. The sadist can pretend and the masochist is kind of like, I'm close to it because I'm close to this God, this perfect being that has sounds, the object. Sounds like what you're saying is that sadomasochism can be a pretty potent spiritual practice. Well, well, that's, that's a, again, a tantric idea, right? So say the masochism can obviously be incredibly destructive if you do it non-consensual, if you do it in an, uh, in an unconscious way. But I mean, if you know what's going on and you can have, have some fun with it, then it's a very powerful practice. That's typical for tantra. So, so you learn how people work and, how you, and that actually means you understand how you, you yourself work, right? It's not about manipulation of other, but it's like you start understanding like, well, this is how we work. This is how I work. This is how I work in relationships. This is how the whole thing works. And then instead of complaining about it and then trying to kind of get to some kind of utopia, whether it's a Christian heaven or a communist utopia or a fascist utopia, you actually deal with the situation as is and you start kind of saying, well, this is workable. I can do something with this. Hmm. So, and, and that's, that's something that is, um, to many people are, so like, you know, okay, so we make fun of woke people or make fun of this group and that group, but you have to be careful in the sense that these people are often, often are trying to, to do something that, that makes sense. They're trying to create a better world. They're trying to, to get rid of a very destructive situation. Only they don't really, they, they still think that there are easy uh, solutions to this. If only the tr Trump wasn't there, if only the communists were not there, if only these people weren't there. And that's, that's not it. That's not going to help. The only thing you're going to do is you're going to uh, vilify people, you're going to vilify your enemies, and you're going to turn into a monster yourself. Well, it's the same structure everywhere. Like, it's the traditionalist. If only the priests were on top. It's the, uh, the New Age <laughs> transcendentalists. Right, if only uh, I meditate hard enough, then I'll yes. transcend my suffering and achieve perfect being. That structure exists everywhere. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, again, that's a, if, you, if I only meditate long enough, 
So then I will reach nirvana. That's masochism. Huh. But yeah, you put yourself in a situation where, where you, I mean, you know, masochists are very interesting. So they, they, so you have these people who kind of, they're in good situations. They constantly blow things up. You know, like that's masochism. Basically, so, you know, you should be happy with this, but they're, you know, they just blow it up. Why are they doing that? Is because they got what they wanted. They're still not happy, right? They still feel that they don't have perfect being. So that means that what they have cannot be good enough. So they blow it up. What? So imagine that you're in a field with a lot of stones, right? And uh, you're being told that um, I'm being told that there's a there's a, a, a big fortune um, a, a big fortune under under a stone, right? So so you lift up all you lift up the small stones and you find. 10 euros here and there and 50 euros and then but it's not it's not enough so how what are you going to end up with you're going to end up with trying to lift the biggest stone you cannot lift because that's where the, that's where the real money is going to be you're only going to be happy until you found the stone you cannot lift that's the masochist position mm. You will need a stone you cannot lift because you've lifted all the other stones. There was money underneath it, but it was never enough. It never made you happy. So that means you need more money. So that means you end up with a stone you cannot lift. You will, you will spend all of your time with trying to lift a the stone. There might be nothing underneath it, and your, your behavior will not make sense to the others. But to you, your soul will make a lot of sense because that's the stone that will have the real treasure that will make you happy, that will give you perfect being. That's masochism. And there's a certain learned enjoyment enjoying this incapacity this this, this self-debasement of one's own agency in the, in the masochist right well the problem is that it's 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 built in mm -hmm. it's a it's a, a natural consequence of, of our triangular desire that's the that's the the tragedy and the comedy at the same time you know the oedipus complex right the freudian oedipus complex mm -hmm. the freud so that means you know you fall in love with your mother you want to kill your father now freud poses this as some kind of that's some kind of essence, you know, that's just something that humans do, but it's actually much worse than that. That's the earliest example of triangular desire. It's just, a, 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 it's just an example of triangular desire. Why do you want your mother? Because you copy desire and you see your father wanting your mother. It's the first time you, you, you go into triangular desire. Because it's, it's, it's at the core of humanity. It's what we do. That's what humans are. They're, they're desire, they're, they are souls of desire. Yourself is a collection of desires you picked up from others. That's yourself. Mm -hmm. And desire always exists tri in, tri in a triangular way? Well, it, it, yes, it's, all, it's triangular. Well, if it's, if it's... Okay, this is something I'm, I've discussed this recently with Alexander and, and uh, Andrew. Um, so normally desire is triangular. There's always a subject, the model, and an object. But you, if you, you can also have diets. So like uh, with, with master-slave, for example, so uh, say the, say this masochist. So there you have a diet because there's, there's, only, a master, there's only a subject and a, and, a, and a model, but there's no object. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to desire, that is, uh, it sounds like uh, the desire that you're describing uh, mostly sexual or what about more Jungian desire does, does it also fall in this in this dyad or triangle uh, or, or can we imagine a desire emerging in any other way well, what, what, what's Jungian Jungian desire no uh, you know for Freud libido is just uh, sexual for Jung libido has a sexual basis, but then refines itself and it can create cathedrals. Ah, and... this is, yeah, no, uh, there we have to go to another, uh, one of my favorites called Jacques Panksepp. You actually have seven drives. So your desire is the way that you fill in because you, you do have some very biological uh, needs, right? It, let's call these the drives. You actually have seven drives. So Freud was not, I mean, Freud kind of, well, I wouldn't characterize Freud, right? But uh, it's, it's certainly not so that everything is sexuality and stuff like that. You actually have seven drives. So three, um, three drives that, you wanna, that drive you away from things and you have four drives that drive you towards things. So, so you have uh, the things that, that are unpleasant are, of course, fear, uh, rage, and grief. So these are different parts in your brain, right? So you have a part for fear, part for grief, part for rage. Grief is when you are, when your girlfriend dumps you, that's grief. When you meet a bear, that's fear. Well, it's seldomly the other way around. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so grief is actually when the tribe kicks you out. 
Uh -huh. so, so heartbreak is rejection by the tribe. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so, so you have fear, uh, anger, and grief. So these these are the things that are very unpleasant. And then the pleasant things that are of course lost, right? Uh, so there are two, two other ones. Guess who they are? Which they are? There is lust. Uh, pff, I don't know, man. Play. Play. Correct. That's a that's mm -hmm. a primary emotion. It's a drive. Your drive to play is very fundamental. Lust. Play. Yeah. Joy? The, the, the third one is care, yeah. friendship. So, so we actually have strong drives to not only to be sexual, but al also to play. This is a very primary emotion and also uh, to have friendship. This is a primary emotion, primary drive. Hmm. And then we have seeking. That's basically curiosity. You, you, you might be in a perfect situation. After some time, you, you will want to change it. That's your, that you could call your libido. It's kind of your, your drive to kind of curiosity, to kind of find new stuff. That's the seventh uh, primary emotion. Now, if you take a cat and you peel away its cortex, right, which is kind of like the higher part of the brain, right, it will still play. Wow. Super, super old. It's in the brainstem, not in the cortex. So all of these primary emotions, right, even if you peel away your cortex, also for humans, you have humans that are, are, are born without the higher brain. So the entire upper part of the brain is not there, right? It's just water. They still uh, respond to, um, to being close to others, you know, care. They still play. They still have the primary emotions. Okay, so this is shared by all mammals and even in reptiles and stuff like that. So that's the bedrock upon the, which desire is, is built. So you still have these very primary things that you want to do, right? But the way in which it's filled in, that's copied. That's uh, the triangle. But I'm trying to ask this very simply. Um, where does masochism and enjoying sort of self-debasement come in in this constellation of drives? The moment where I enjoy my own pain, where does, where does it exist? Well, I mean, I, I think that, so, so this is, so again, you can explain things in terms of uh, very primary emotions, mm. but usually what, what we are doing is, uh, is a combination of, of our primary emotions and, and uh, our very complex cortex, so the thinking brain. Okay. Right, so you can, you can basically think about it that humans have three brains. We have a, 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 a thinking brain, we have an emotional brain, and we have a mimetic brain. You know your emotional brain, you can feel it. You know your thinking brain, you're aware of your thoughts. You're not aware of your mimetic brain. You don't, you don't feel that, oh, I just picked up, uh, I just picked up uh, Owen's desire for, uh, for, for Coca-Cola. God damn it. You, you don't feel that, but it's just, it kind of shapes yourself it kind of, so, yeah, so it's a very interesting idea. So, so what the, Girard would say, like, your unconscious is basically the stuff that you pick up from others. Fantastic. Yeah. Whereas yeah, it, then, like, Daniel, you were talking about Jungian desire, whereas the Jungian unconscious is far more some, symbolic and arch archetypal, right? It's like they're these universal patterns whatever those are defined as whether they're like constellations of brain activity or <laughs> types of experience in the world but then attached to particular symbols so for example a horse for being uh, oh i've forgotten what the horse is daniel what's the horse like you sent me an article about the horse the other day in the, Indian centaur, centaur, the satire satire well it doesn't matter at any rate the point is that these different <laughs> symbols, archetypes, tropes show up cross-culturally, cross-mythologically, and apparently in the Jungian theory represent diff different types of desiring experience or, or conscious experience. Like, one of the tricky things, or perhaps what we lose in a, in a Girardian reading of religion and culture is the place of these symbols like jesus as fish means very little to a union no, to a gerardian reading whereas jesus as fish in a uh, in a union he's written the whole book about this the book ion which <laughs> i'm getting tired and i can't really remember what it's about now <laughs> this is the fish i have to read that yeah yeah it's a weird one Hmm. But Owen, well, yeah, I think Jordan Peterson goes goes uh, goes on about that. Yeah, but 
I think that these are, uh, I don't think this is so, um, I don't think this is so exclusive, uh, these, these things. Uh, I mean, imagine that, so you, you have like, uh, you know, humanity that's cross-linked uh, in a network uh, through mimetic desire. And then you might have certain patterns that arise. And then you can, you can maybe recognize them. And so like the old man who is admired by the community and stuff like that. I mean, that might be a very common pattern. That is, a, is an outcome of, of, a, of a networked uh, triangular desire. So I, there's actually, I have a book. I haven't really studied it yet, but it's called, Ar it's called Archetypal Process. Um, and uh, okay, that brings in Whitehead as well. But let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I think that... that I think that, you know, people like Freud and Jung and Lacan and, and Girard and stuff like that, I think, I don't think that all that, they certainly have, have mistakes and errors and shortcomings and stuff like that, but often just by cross-linking them and reading them and, and looking from Jung from, looking at Jung from a Girardian point of view or looking at, uh, at Girard from a Lacanian point of view, these exercises are very, very uh, worthwhile, I think. I do mm -hmm. that a lot. So, so what... What was the comment you made on the uh, about the Dugin video about like being back in the realms of the uh, the unconscious or the symbolic mind? Something like this. Do you know what I'm referring to? I don't really remember. I mean, I haven't studied uh, I haven't studied uh, Dugin at all. Apart from no, 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 no. It was just something in a thread you said about it. Like, and I think like I wrote in our emails just before this, like a, a word that Andrew used recently was like Levy Brawl's participation mystique. There's something about being in like a very archetypal and symbolic world that's actually quite um, archaic. Well, you know when, I, when I listen, so I, when, what I like about Girard is that I, I read this guy and I go like, oh, now I really, I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientist, right? I have a scientific brain. I, when I read Girard, it's kind of like, that's how it works. I mean, I think it's even worse than scientists. I think I'm an engineer. I mean, actually, I am an engineer. I have a master's in engineering. <laughs> you don't just think it. So I, I, there, I said it. Now you know. So I like, you know, oh, that's how it works. So, and I mean, I can enjoy, I can certainly enjoy, uh, you know, Eric Neumann and, and, and all of these things and Jung. And, but often, you know, when, when I put down the book and I go, well, that was a great read. I had so much fun. But what did I actually learn? Um, I can't really say anything about it, right? This is a good read and I, I opened my mind and oh, I didn't look at it like that, but I don't really have the feeling that I understand the, the things better. And, and when you read a great philosopher or a great scientist or a great thinker, you understand stuff. You're suddenly like, that's why that happens. And I think that's, that's for me the criterion of, of deciding like, like this is somebody that I, I want to study deeper or this is just somebody to get it interesting. But. Fantastic. In, uh, I noticed how, you're, how you are indeed an engineer and an AI guy when uh, you were mentioning, yes, humanity exists in a network so as a network. Everybody desires. Desire exists and mimics itself in a network. And what came to mind immediately is that, oh, shit, then we can parameterize desire if we can figure out just the ways to extract that data. And then there will be ways, there will be, this is unavoidable, to be able to solve these large data sets that, would take, that, that, that are about desire. And therefore, the machines will understand us better than we understand ourselves. And... I, I just want to mention that that feels unavoidable in a way. Yeah, this is the data anthropology, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, until recently, you know, you want to want to you wanted to study people, you gave them a survey, <laughs> and then they would they would botch it, you know, filling it in, and they would lie, and then and, and, you know, and now you just look at the data, right? I mean, wh wh why is there a big big uh, gap in the map in in Amsterdam? Well, because everybody turns off their mobile phone when they go into the red light district, right? But of course, and then the AI sees that, you know, the, the data is there, you know, they turn off their phone there. I mean, you know, you, you can just analyze everything, right? And there's an enormous amount of data points. So well, Alexander Bart talks a lot about that, right? Data anthropology. And, and uh, um, I think there's, there's a book by some, some Google book guy called, um, you know, Everybody Lies or something like that, um, which, is, which is about that. And, and yeah, definitely we will. We will uh, but, but again, well, 
um, and this is also something that uh, Greg Henriquez from uh, from the IDW brought this up, right? That uh, that yeah, you you have the data and you can do all, all of this this uh, analysis here and there and stuff like that. But often that also gives you a very limited uh, very limited understanding, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like for example, this this whole theory that we've been discussing all evening, Girard, right? I mean, you're not going to get that from AI, right? No, no, I mean, no. Girard, no. Girard uh, stumbled across it. He started by analyzing French literature. And, and then he suddenly started seeing patterns everywhere. So they're describing the same situations. You can find them in Dostoevsky, in Cervantes, in Maupassant, and so on and so on. And suddenly he realized, well, there's something really deep here. And then he started uh, studying anthropology, and, and then it turned, turned into, into this, this very big theory. That's a human being. So but you can maybe... Uh, come again? But it does allow us to optimize uh, sclaven morale dynamics. It doesn't it's allow... In other words, it, it will not, the AI will not generate these insights like Girard did, but it will certainly allow us to optimize for a few threads in the slave moral world and attain great leverage of power in there. Well, it's just a different form of, of intelligence, right? It's kind of like it will give us data. It will give us an enormous amount of, uh, enormous amount of, uh, of, um, of, of, of power to kind of extract extract wisdom from data so to say right but there's still a lot of, of uh, there's still a great task for human beings I think um, one of the, the the problems I've heard floated about this big data analysis or artificial intelligence is like when you can have humongous data sets and then train an algorithm to just go through and look for patterns, the scientific method is no longer necessary for at least discovering patterns, right? Or maybe that's not the right way of wording it, but at least the scientific method where you come up with a hypothesis that you can falsify and then test and collect evidence to see whether it's true or not. That's not what you would do with trawling a big data set. There, you trawl the data first and then draw the conclusions from it. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, so it becomes much more data driven. Yes. Um, but so, so is that just a different way of practicing science? Like, I mean, maybe I'm thinking of it, or maybe the person who wrote this article I read is a bit of a purist about this traditional method of the falsifiable hypothesis. Yeah. Well, I mean, the scientific method is in practice, you know, the, 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 it's a bit like, you know, this is a very pragmatic uh, human activity, right? Science. Um, and it changes all the time. It changes with, with uh, technology. It changes with, with attitude and stuff like that. So there is no... Science will change because the technology changes, because the... the uh, because the, 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 also the, the sophistication of using statistical method changes. And, and science has always, has always been... There, there's no... There's no fixed way of doing science, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, so okay. also if you look at Newton, right? Newton was studying, uh, you know, he was studying the Bible and astrology mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I mean, there was no, there was no, no contradiction there uh, at that time. That was all fine and dandy. And now, uh, now it's a completely other, now there, there are completely other ways of, of, of doing science. And in a couple of hundred years, it will be unrecognizable. These things are always in process. Well, that's another thing, right? I mean, we didn't uh, talk about uh, process philosophy or whitehead or anything like that. But I mean, that's that's uh, that's another thing. That there's no so that's that's related to the, what we talked about, right? It's always been a disaster. You know, we're always in process on the way somewhere because it's not good here, and that's always going to be like that. Maybe until we we die out and the AI uh, takes over and, and it's all going to be boring because there will be no more uh, there will be no more pops and no more beer. <laughs> There'll be no more soda masochism yeah, yeah. unless no the AIs either. figure out their no own. Soda masochism and no more beer. I mean, that's not a, a life worth living. So that's not good. <laughs> well, well I mean, let's hope no. the best we can do is, is a is a symbiosis with AI, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not so fond of this, uh, you know, transhumanism and, and uh, blending with the machines and, and uh, uploading your mind and stuff like that. I think that is a complete. Um, under, on, that's underestimating what the human body is. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, why would you want to give that up? I mean, you always think like the people who think that that's kind of like, oh, let's do that, upload in the machine, stuff like that. What kind of relationship do they have to their bodies? <laughs> <Kinda> like, 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's another topic, maybe. I mean, you're going to talk about that soon with uh, with my friends uh, Timo in Paris, right? So that, that should be. Hell yeah, man! I think we got uh, we got them booked in in a couple of weeks. Should we wrap this up, guys? I think my brain is at its uh, its limit. Oh my god, we've been we've been uh, bubbling for two hours. Yes, two hours. Jesus Christ, it's gonna be a long one. That well, was uh, all fun. Great. Very much fun. Is there any anything? Any last comments? Any last tip? Well, keep keep uh, inviting uh, um, uh, controversial uh, people, weirdos. You know, wherever you can find them. I mean, we need more conversation and more uh, out of the box thinking. So I think it's great that you got, you know, Dugin uh, over and <laughs> so much fun. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, people are so uh, worried about controversy these days and stuff like that. Everything needs to fit in a nice little box. Uh, everything needs to be uncontroversial and stuff like that. I mean, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to talk to a lot of people and, and, and hear some outrageous opinions. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the Dugan interview, doing that was a bit of a practice for me because I felt so much resistance. In, I think that like, the middle class good boy was like, no, 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 no. This is a bad idea. And then I did it and it was fine. And I was like, and then of course the little bit inside of me that was like, you're going to get totally shut. You're going to get kicked out of the tribe. Well, nobody cares except the people who are already in the tribe that listen to it. You know, techno social is not. <laughs> I mean, you always have the chance that, you know, something will be picked up and then suddenly you're all over the place. Right. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the name of the game now. And uh, I mean, you know, you have to take that risk. And what's yeah. the alternative? Otherwise, we can derive some enjoyment from our own public self-debasement and invent a tribe that also enjoys it and become pariahs. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, uh, that's Nietzsche again, right? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's Donald Trump's uh, PR I mean, campaign. The first, was, uh, the first version was what doesn't kill you can make you very sick, but, but let's, not, uh, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> okay, guys, I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing more of your uh, conversations. Uh, Fantastic. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and, and, and let's have some beers after this uh, uh, little COVID uh, um, uh, uh, crisis is over. It's high time that uh, people get together again and, and discuss over beer. Yeah.